to know what, say, Donald Trump thinks, would you ask Nancy Pelosi? <laughs> All right. If you want to know what the, what the policies and the philosophies of the Republican Party are, you're not going to ask Bernie Sanders. And similarly, if you want to know what makes Barack Obama tick, you're not going to ask George Bush, right? Because what you're going to get is a propaganda tool. You're going to get a, a images drawn from the language of propaganda and political ideology. You're not actually going to get uh, decent historical analysis. All right? And that's what we're up against in trying to understand the Reformation. All right, so you guys still with me? All right, now, um, in brief, what I got out of all, all of this was a deep appreciation for the doctrines of Catholicity, unity, liturgy, sacramental realism, church authority, all of these very, very Catholic ideals were taught by the Reformers themselves. And they latched onto the language of Luther's peculiar theology, his justification by faith and grace alone, faith alone, and scripture alone, as the vehicle to break away from what they viewed as an inefficient, corrupt, uh, bureaucratic Roman hierarchy but in order to come back to an essentially Catholic vision of reform, all right, they wanted to teach the centrality of the liturgy, of the authority of the church embodied in a God like Calvin, all right, the doctrines of grace and the sacraments and so forth. And what's happened now 500 years later is that the essentially Catholic impetus behind the Reformation has been lost and it's been obscured under these few abstract formula that have taken on the character of historical polemics. So, so Studying this out as a historian, when I began to see the Catholic intent of the reformers, all right, in the confused state of scholarship about it, I began to realize there's, there's a deeper reality here than I've been led to, led to consider. Now, those bells are driving me nuts. Okay. Um, so to unpack this, I want to start with a question. Now, I've already set you up, okay? I've already set you up so you kind of know where I'm going. Why was there a reformation? Now, I've already, I've already kind of told you where I'm not going, but if I were to ask, the, if I hadn't set you up, or if I had to ask this question to another audience, what do you think the most common response is to the question, why was there a Reformation? Exactly, exactly. The most common perception is that the Reformation happened as a response to corruption in the church and the sale of indulgences and the like. All right. And you will hear that from Protestants, and you will hear that from Catholics. Now, I have two things to say about it. Number one, Luther himself explicitly repudiates that interpretation of the Reformation. Okay, I'm going to read to you a passage from a book that Luther wrote in 1525 called On the Bondage of the Will. It was a response to a treatise written by Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus was a Catholic polemicist and a humanist and the greatest scholar of his age. And when Erasmus took up the pen against Luther, he didn't attack Luther on uh, his doctrine of authority or, or his rejection of indulgences, he attacked Luther precisely on the question of the freedom of the will. He said, Luther, you deny the freedom of the will, and that's the key issue. And Luther writes Erasmus back, and he says this to Erasmus. I greatly commend, and I extol you for this thing also, that you are the only man of all my antagonists that has attacked the heart of the subject, the head of the cause, Instead of wearing me out with those extraneous points, the papacy, purgatory, and indulgences, and a number of like topics, which may more fitly be called trifles than matters of debate, a sort of chase in which nearly all my opponents have been hunting me hitherto in vain. You are the single and solitary individual who has seen the hinge of the matter in dispute and hath aimed at the neck, and I thank you for this from my heart. Luther himself said the matter of indulgences, papacy, purgatory, and the like were trifles, not matters of debate. Right? So the first problem with interpreting the Reformation as a response to corruption is that the main dude in the Reformation says that's not what it was about. Okay? Now there's another problem with attributing the Reformation principally to corruption. How many of you think that Corruption in the 16th century Catholic Church was something new. Anybody here want to take that vote? Okay, no. Now, if you've ever read the, the documents of the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, so we're talking 300 years before the Reformation, it was in large part a, a reforming council to deal with corruption and abuse. Okay, so this is something that's been going on a long time in the church. 
Uh, anybody here ever heard of St. Peter Damien? St. Peter Damien wrote a book called the Liber Gamorianus in the 11th century, which was an attack on the sexual immorality being practiced by the Catholic clergy at the time. All right? St. Gregory of Nazianzus, all right? one, of the, one of the great Greek fathers of the church, all right? became 5th century patriarch of Constantinople. He didn't want the job. You know why? Because of all of the corruption in the church in 5th century Constantinople. All right? If you've read the canons of the Council of Nicaea, they're replete with directives to eliminate corruption in the church. Okay, um, How many people have ever read the, the biblical book of 3rd John? It's in the Bible, right? It's in the 27 books of the canonical New Testament. 3rd John. Well, the issue in 3rd John is Diotrephes. Diotrephes is a corrupt Catholic bishop all right, who was kicking people out of the church because they were loyal to St. John. All right. In other words, how many people think we've gotten rid of corruption today? All right. There has never been an era in the church's history in which there were not corruption. If corruption were a sufficient explanation for the Reformation, then we should have been having reformations every five minutes for the last 2,000 years. All right. But the point of fact is the peculiar form of reformation that took place in 16th century Europe and in Saxony and France especially all right, is something that emerged only in that peculiar place and time in history and no place else in the world. You don't see a Protestant reformation popping up in Coptic Egypt in the 5th century, and it wasn't because the Copts were so unbelievably pure. Oh, I mean, I like the cops. Fine, I'm not taking out on the cops, but you see my point, okay? So what did change? If it wasn't the, pres the, the presence of corruption in the church, what changed was the perception of corruption in the church. How people at the time viewed the reality of corruption and what ought to be done about it, and how they thought they should respond to it, all right? And in particular, where did the idea come from that you should respond to corruption through primitivism, right? A, a key dogma of the Reformation is that we should return to the early church, to a pristine form of Christianity in antiquity, and that's the way to deal with corruption. Where did that idea come from? Question, does the New Testament endorse the doctrine of primitivism? Does the New Testament itself ever tell us that the New Testament is an ideal expression of Christian life to which we should return? No, nearly every letter of the apostles in the New Testament is dealing with the problem of corruption. All right? There's nothing in the data of the New Testament that suggests that the New Testament era is ideal. Far from it. All right? If anything, the, doctrine, the, the, the historical doctrine embedded in the New Testament is eschatological and developmental. The kingdom of God here in seed, that then will grow to be like the great tree with the olive branches with all the birds come and nest. It would suggest the opposite dynamic one of, of, in, of, in, of developing and in, increasing elaboration and holiness over time, not the opposite, which is primitivism. So where does the idea of primitivism come from? You don't find it in St. Augustine, right? Augustine has no doctrine of Christian primitivism, all right? He does have a respect for tradition, but that's a different thing. In fact, Augustine has, if anything, a far more cyclical view of history, that we're going to have to like, be born again every generation in, in, in every human soul until the end of the time because the problem of sin and corruption and, and death and hell and the devil is never going to end right until the coming of Christ. There's no doctrine of primitivism per se. You don't get it in Eusebius. He thinks the kingdom of God has come with Constantine. All right? So you're not going to get primitivism out of these early documents. So where does this idea come from? Any ideas? What do you think? How many people have heard of St. Odo of Cluny? St. Odo of Cluny, all right? What characterizes the spiritual life of medieval Europe more than anything else? Benedictine monasticism, all right? Telling, then, I should start the discussion of my son and his experience, all right? Benedictine monasticism is the most characteristic feature, the most defining feature of spirituality in the Latin West for a thousand years, 